Hey, <laughs> Tony, what? <laughs> Let me have a glass of water, drink no of water here first. <laughs> See if I can do the talk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. We'll start with uh, Pete from Sky Sports News, please. Mm. Right, great to see you back in the training pitch. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Feeling? I'm feeling good. Thank you. Feeling yeah, good. Excellent. But how was that experience watching remotely? Not good. And in fact, we couldn't get the the link was sent to us or the. A uh, young physiotherapist who who sort of accompanied me was keeping me company, um, and we, I think you sent a link. Uh, Joe sent a link, but we couldn't get it to work. Unfortunately, so we had the even worse experience of listening to it on the radio, and that's not something I would recommend. <laughs> so having watched it back now, what, was your, what do you make of it? And uh, the three late for the goals as well. Well, our taken it's very simple. I think we played well. I think, I think we certainly deserve to get a point from the game and we we're unhappy with the penalty decision. So, I mean, that's basically our take on it. But certainly the performance, in my opinion, watching it back was, was good. I thought it was. Listening to the radio, I got quite good vibes. And when I spoke to Ray Lewington, who came and uh, to the hospital directly afterwards, you know, he said he was very satisfied and pleased with the performance. So I was expecting it to be quite good watching it back, but in fact, in fact, if anything, it was better than I even could have expected. So does that make it even more frustrating those late goals and also that VAR decision? Think? Yeah, of course it makes it frustrating, but that's part of football, and you see it every week. I mean, watching the games as one does, albeit often only the highlights. Uh, a large percentage of games have a decision in them which is often quite decisive and which perhaps I really don't agree with, but I'm not a referee. OK, looking forward to tomorrow in terms of team news. Jordan, you obviously went off early on in that game. How's he feeling? No, he's fine. It was a, it was a nasty blow he took, which gave him a dead leg, but he's recovered well from that and trained yesterday. And, of course, we, we've recovered Mark Gay, luckily, as well, who picked up a bit of an injury playing for playing for England, um, but that's recovered as well during the course of the week. And so the players we have out are long-term, I suppose, or continually long-term are Alise and Flenka. And a shorter term, we have Lerma, Tomkins, and unfortunately Ahamada, because he sprained his ankle on, on Tuesday. A, a freak one, again, no one near him at the time, just stretched to control a ball and caught his foot in the turf and it sprained his ankle so those three are not serious injuries but they're going to keep players out for a period of time okay, it sounded like Elise might have had a serious setback though is that right he had a setback I don't know how serious one can one can say it was because to be fair when the injury happened we were told it would be between three and four months and there wasn't much chance of him being back before then he worked very hard, got himself into a position where people thought maybe he could take some part in training. And unfortunately, that's when there was a slight hiccup and a slight setback. But he's working well on that, as is Matthias Franco. And they're both online, if you like, to come back fairly soon. OK, good. Um, Abruce, as a potentially 100 games for Crystal Palace, if he gets on tomorrow, or plays tomorrow. Oh, good job you told me that. I didn't know that. <laughs> Um, there's been reports about new contract talks with him. Is there any update on that you can give us? Not me, no. If you want updates on any contract situation at the club, that's dealt with by Steve Parrish and Doug Friedman, and especially contracts of, of that nature. Um, so if you really wanted details about what's happening and if anything's happening, I'm afraid you have to speak to them because I don't get involved in the contracts. I, I just expect the club to provide me with the players. Um, we saw Elise sign a longer-term deal in the summer as well, and now let's talk about Eze potentially extending as well. Does this prove that Palace is a good place for young players to develop and thrive at the moment? Well, I'd like to think that. I think we, I think the squad we have now is is a good one. It's certainly a lot stronger than maybe squads we've we've had in the past, and in particular, it's a lot younger and a lot more athletic than perhaps certain teams that we've had in the past. So I think the club's going to be very happy with the way they've moved things forward and, and changed to some extent the 
um, the way the team looks and uh, I think at the moment it is a good place for young players to develop because we we play in my opinion good football and of course if you're a young player at Crystal Palace you've got more chance of keeping a place or getting into the team than maybe you would have if you're one of the more established clubs playing European football where the squad is so much bigger than the squad we carry. You have a striker up front in form at the moment Bottom Edward. Four and five. Did you see signs in the summer that he was going to hit the ground running like this? I must say that you know, we were pretty happy with him last last season too. But uh, there's no doubt that in the summer, I think we did see that uh, he'd made a step forward. I mean, it's like everything else. You you, know, you come into a club, you've got ten games. The way you go about the work is a bit different, perhaps, to what the players experienced before and sometimes they need to bed into that experience so I think we saw in the summer that he's bedding into the experience very well and coming very much to terms with what we would like to see from him <clears throat> and luckily that's carried on into the season and even more fortuitous I suppose in some ways is that a strike partner or, or someone who can also play up front JP Mateta is also doing well so when he's been called upon uh, to do something for us, he's stepped on the field and done it. Excellent. And Fulham tomorrow, what's the challenge they're going to bring to you? Well, they're a good team. I also think they're a good club, of course, but they, they're also a very good team. And uh, Marco Silva's done a, a, an outstandingly good job. I think they have everything you want, really, from a, a premiership team. They're organised, they've got quality players, they, they work very hard, and they know what they're doing. They've played together for a while, so they're... Um, habits, if you like, are well ingrained. So I don't think any team is going to come up against Fulham and have anything other than a, a tough challenge. But it's up to us to to face that challenge, and it's up to us to produce good enough football to overcome them. Okay, good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Hi, Roy. Roger. Good to see you back. Um, just expanding on talking about Fulham, there. Obviously, your focus is Crystal Palace now, but I presume there's still affections for a for a former club. And uh, and it seems as if you have uh, quite a warm relationship with Marco Silva. He spoke very kindly about you yesterday. Do you look at the club now and think it's in is in the hands of a really good custodian right now? I do. I do. I, I mean, of course. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a good friend of Alistair McIntosh's, who's done a really good job there since he came in really pretty much around the same time as I did as chief executive. He's done a fantastic job. I know some of the coaching staff, the goalkeeper coach Vic Bettinelli, an outstandingly good good guy. I don't know so well the people that Marco's brought with him, but there's no doubt that since he came into the club, he's approached it in absolutely the right way. He's understood the club, I think. He's understood where they are and what they're capable of doing and where they can go to. And he's done it within the confines, if you like, of the type of budget that clubs like Crystal Palace and Fulham have to work in. So full of praise for what he's done, full of praise for the, the club. Um, I'm always happy to see them win as long as I'm not managing the team on the other side. You, you bracketed them in together there in terms of working with the confines, Crystal Palace and, and Fulham. When you look at the league table, same amount of points, identical records almost. Do you, even at this early stage of the season, are you looking at them as direct rivals in terms of being where, where you want to be? Well, it's a good question, but I don't know I'm looking at anybody in terms of rivalry at this moment in time. I think with five games gone and we have still at least two or possibly three or even four players who I think might impact our team when they get fit again. I think it'd be a bit foolish to start concerning myself too much at this stage, whether we're one place in front of them or one place behind. But I do think that over the long term and going into May next year, I would expect both of us two teams to be pushing for places in, in the top ten. So in that respect, they are alive, I guess. Um, come back to last week's game and the previous games, it's been pointed out, I mean, a, a couple of or three late goals conceded um, by Palace at the, at the end, end of matches. Um, is that something to, that concerns you at, at the moment, to see that happen, and I think three goals in the last two games after 90 minutes? Or is that simply a product of the fact we've seen this extended stoppage time? Well, but if you're not careful, you're going to get me started on the penalty which cost us the game. And as to Villa, the third goal didn't bother me at all. Um, there was two minutes left, three minutes left to play, 
and it was pretty obvious that the team wanted to try and get back in it if they could and as a result you open yourself up and you lose 3-1 instead of 2-1 but uh, I think certainly in that occasion uh, on a normal day I think we'd have had a luckier outcome with the referee in decision and we would have got a point from the game and I think everyone would have been saying what a wonderful performance it was because Aston Villa were a strong team at home. Um, just on the point of, of stoppage time, we are seeing, I think there was nine minutes of stoppage time in that game, you saw it in the Spurs game as well. Um, we knew it was coming in, now we've had sort of five, six games into the season. Well, what's your take on this, these sort of extended stoppage times in the play? I think they're exaggerated. I mean, I think there's no doubt that when you have a VAR review, you've got to stop the clock there because there's no doubt about that. But I think... It's a fairly easy thing to do. I, I've always thought to add on time for time-wasting. And I must say that I don't believe in time-wasting in the first 10 minutes of the game. I don't know what teams in our league <clears throat> go out to waste time after 10 minutes and get players booked. Um, I think if there's going to be any time-wasting at all, it would be when a team's clean on to a result in the last 10 or 15 minutes and... My memory, the most referees have done well in adding that time on. I don't know that we need to exaggerate it. Um, the time-wasting side of thing for me is exaggerated. I don't think the behaviour with players and coaches towards the referee, I, I embrace that 100% fully. But I certainly don't embrace the time-wasting and I really don't embrace the stopping free kicks um, because... On several occasions, what I've seen is the players found it very difficult to get out of the way. <laughs> when a free kick's given and the ball's dropped down at the your feet and the other guy's feet and he picks it up and wants to take the kick, it's very difficult to get 10 yards away. So they're the things I'd like to see the referee and people, the PGMOL, is, it? is that right? I'd like to see them constantly dealing with that. But uh, I'm not a part of the PGMOL and I'm not a part of the process which decides what refereeing changes and rule changes there should be. But I'm just giving you an honest opinion of what I actually think about it based on a lifetime in football. Given that they could easily add on sort of nine, ten minutes at the end, does that change the way you approach it? Are you thinking like we're getting to the 19th minute and you, when you think about substitutions, oh, yeah. do you think there could be another ten minutes? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we, we've come to terms already with the fact that... Not, but to be honest, even before this season started, I was working on a 95-minute game. There wasn't many games that didn't have five, sometimes even six minutes of extra time. So we're only talking marginal differences. Um, I think the differences often come about because of VAR. Uh, but we've accepted and you know, many people have even embraced VAR. I think it's a very good thing. Well, if we do think that then I'm afraid that every time the referee is sent to the screen, uh, there's going to be time added on. But can it impact psychologically on a, on a team? Maybe they're hanging on to a 1-0, seeing the game out, they reach the 19th minute and all of a sudden the ball goes up, it says another 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've got to learn to do it. It's a good point, it's a good question, but uh, that's part of your job to come to terms with that, the resilience needed. We, all of us, because we're entrenched to some extent in our past histories of the game, I think we're all a little bit entrenched in the idea of, right, 90 minutes is up, blow the whistle. But it's been quite a long time now since we accepted that that's not going to happen. And now we just have to accept that, you know, what used to be four to six can now be six to 12. And, you know, you've got to find the way to make certain you deal with that and from a substitute point of view, of course, that too. When you're putting a substitute on, you're not maybe putting him on for 20 minutes. You might be putting him on for 30, 35 minutes. That's great. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. That's the end of the broadcast section. Thanks, guys.